This morning I'm reading um, from the book of John, chapter 15, verses 13 through 15. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Becky. Love those children's messages. And thank you all for being here. It's really good to see everyone. Those at home, welcome. It's really good to um, all, all of us again to be together. For those that don't know me, my name's Brad Hill. I've been a part of this church for a long time, and I love Falling Spring Church. I love being a part of a church where people really know how to love each other. And I've experienced so much love and so much friendship over the years. I'm just really thankful. So I'd like to pray for us. God, thank you for your word. Inspire us. Speak to us. Lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created sky and land. He created water and he separated different parts of the land and, and water into oceans and sea. Then he created trees and plants and then he created animals. And every time he created something, he said, it is good. It is good. It is good. He created another set of, of things, of beautiful things. It is good. Then he created human beings and said, it is very good. And then in Genesis chapter 2, suddenly God said, it is not good. Interesting. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's not good. Genesis 2.18, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, ladies, some of your radar just went up. Eve, a helper, really? Women are supposed to be helpers of men. Let me, let me remind you that the Hebrew word for helper there is the same Hebrew word that is used multiple times in the Old Testament to refer to God. God, our helper. And in the New Testament, uh, we see the Holy Spirit as our helper. So this is not a subservient helper. This is a, a much of a collaborative uh, experience here. So I just needed to say that in case anyone tuned me out all of a sudden. Um, so it's not good for man to be alone. This is really interesting to me because when Adam was born, created, he walked and talked with God like none of us ever have. He walked and talked with God in the flesh, and they, were, they could see one another. They could be with one another. And this is an amazing existence, I think. It must have been an amazing existence for Adam to be able to walk with God in such a pure and, and unblocked way. And yet God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. In other words, God wanted to impress at the very beginning that our relationship with him comes first. It's the number one relationship. If we don't get that right, it will be difficult to get any other relationship right. But relationships with people are incredibly important. From God's point of view and from our experience, we know that. Relationships are incredibly important. And we are on a series, week two of a series uh, about relationships, and I'm calling it Who Are My People? And th the challenge is to really think about the different kinds of relationships that, that we have. And there are four types of relationships that Dr. Darius Daniels, who's an amazing uh, leader and culture and writer and pastor and speaker, uh, just an amazing individual, amazing human being, and he's written a book called Relational Intelligence, and he talks about four types of relationships. And we're going to go through those in the next couple of weeks uh, today we're going to talk about friends. Friends. Who are your friends? And I'm curious. Uh, well, first some review uh, before I get into that. Um, last week we talked about how all people are made in the image of God. Imago Dei. All of us are made in the image of God. And if we remember that in every interaction that we have, both with the things that we do and say on the outside, as well as the, the way we think on the inside, um, the world will get better. I believe, if we just remember that, that all people are made in the image of God. So we love all people, but we treat people differently. And, and this makes a little, it makes some people a little uncomfortable. But here's the point. All people need to be loved biblically, 
valued equally, because again, we're all made in God's image, but treated differently. We need to be intentional in our relationship. In other words, love is freely given to all people, but access to us, access to our secrets, to our dreams, that needs to be earned. Love is freely given, but access needs to be earned. So today we're going to talk about friends. And I'm curious, I just want you to think for a moment, what do you think of or who do you think of when you use the word friend? Sometimes we use that word, I think, too loosely. We might introduce somebody that we don't really know that well or we're not really that close with or we don't share our hopes and dreams with, but we might introduce them to another person, an acquaintance that we know that they don't, and say, hey, I want you to meet my friend so-and-so, and and we use the word friend. Or we might say, hey, look, friends, it's great to see you, friends. It's tempting for me to say that every week. Hello, friends. We want to call everyone friends, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but what I want us to think about today is who are my friends? Who are your friends? Who do you position in that category of friend, a person that you give not just love to, but access to, a person who has earned your trust. I believe culture tells us that the friend category can just be people that you like or that you feel good about. But from a biblical perspective, it's based on fruit. It's based on the fruit of their actual lives and their actions and the things that they do and say. And please understand, this is not an invitation to judge people. If I were lactose intolerant and you offered me a glass of milk and a glass of water, I would choose water. Not because I'm judging milk. Oh, not not milk. Milk is horrible. Milk is terrible. Milk is, I'm not judging milk. I'm discerning that milk is not good for me because I'm lactose intolerant. So I'm going to choose the water. You're not judging a person by saying, I'm not positioning them in the friend category. You're discerning that the, 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 the fruit of this person They've not earned that kind of access in my life. And and you will save yourself a lot of stress and frustration and anger and heartache if you do this, if you use this discernment process. In the, the passage today, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Again, it's not about feelings, it's about fruit. Jesus now is talking about friendship. You are my friends if you do what I command. In other words, there needs to be some trust built by action that is consistent with what I'm commanding. And Jesus can say that. We, we can't necessarily say that. Then in verse 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. So he must have formerly called them servants because he says, I no longer call you servants. In other words, you used to be in this category and you didn't know everything. I didn't share everything with you. But now, instead, continuing in verse 15, instead, I now call you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. The disciples had proven themselves. And so Jesus was now giving them more access and saying, everything God has made known to me. I am making known to you. You see him shifting the, the trust level, the, ac- the level of access that he's giving them because they had proven themselves. So this is an essential evaluation that all of us need to make. Who are your friends? Are too many people in that category? Are you sharing too much with too many people and trust is being broken? And we're going to do this in two, kind of two phases. I'm going to ask five questions. And first, I want us to evaluate ourselves. And then I want to evaluate our friendships. Question number one, do I love unconditionally? Because if we're talking about who are my friends, we need to first say, am I the type of person who is a faithful friend to others? Am I the type of person who biblically models friendship? Do I love unconditionally? Do I create space for my friends where they are welcome, whether they're in a good mood or a bad mood? Do I sit with them and and occupy space with them, not only when things are going well for them, but when things are not going well and they need somebody to be there to support them or maybe just be with them? That's inconvenient. 
but unconditional love, beautiful but inconvenient at times. Do I love unconditionally? Do I create a no judgment zone for my friends where I'm not going to be the judge all the time? Jesus on the cross was suffering physically, spiritually. He had not only been beaten, but rejected and mocked and scorned. And the very people who put him there, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He said to a criminal beside him, today you will be with me in paradise. Peter, who said, I will go to death with you, denied him three times. And later, after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus meets with Peter. I think they met alone. If you really read the gospel accounts of post-resurrection, I think that there was a meeting between just Jesus and Peter. And then you see in John 21 on the beach where Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? And he says, I give you a mission. I'm reinstating you. I trust you, Peter. I love you unconditionally. You denied me three times but I still love you. I love you unconditionally. Question number two. Do I demonstrate integrity? Am I consistent? Ask yourself this. Do I act one way when I'm with somebody, but a different way when I'm not with them? That will catch up quickly. This is about trust. Do I demonstrate integrity? Not just have the intention of integrity, but do I actually demonstrate integrity so that I can build trusting relationships where people know what to expect from me because it's consistent? Do I build those kinds of relationships where there's actual trust? In Matthew 22, the Pharisees and the Herodians were working together. These two groups working together to trap Jesus. And they said this to Jesus. They were flattering him, but they were also speaking truth about him. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity. Jesus lived his life with integrity. And then they they put this trap on him about paying taxes. And if Jesus said yes, he would, would have been seen as a supporter of Rome. And if he said no, the Herodians would have regarded him as a traitor. So Jesus was in a pickle If he answered yes, people were going to not like him. If he answered no, people were not going to like him. And this situation would be a nightmare for those of us who are people pleasers. You know, you want everyone to like you and you want everyone to be happy about you in the moment and approve of you. And that would be like, what am I going to do? Because if I say this, this group's going to disapprove and this group's going to approve. And if I say this, this group, you know, it's difficult. But Jesus answered brilliantly with integrity brilliantly with integrity. This test did not unnerve him. It did not loosen his grip on who he was. And Matthew tells us that when they heard his response, they were amazed. I'm not going to tell you because I want you to read more scripture. So go to Matthew 22 and figure out what he said. Question number three. If you have a weak stomach, I'm sorry. Do I pass the booger test? Do I pass the booger test? You know, you've been there when you're with somebody and they've got a satellite hanging in the right nostril and you don't know them very well and you're not that comfortable with them and you're afraid to say something and you're afraid to be brutally honest, really truthful with them and so you hold it in. You're just like sitting there staring at it, trying not to stare at it, but staring at it and it's awkward. Anyone ever been there? (laughs) No one. Nobody raised their hand. Okay, maybe it's just me. But a true friend, a true friend is going to tell you when you have a satellite hanging in your right nostril. I I don't just mean to talk about boogers. Uh, A true friend tells the truth even when it's uncomfortable. A true friend is honest, not just about their motivations and what they mean, but they're honest when their friend is going in a direction that according to their discernment, they they realize their friend is going to harm themselves. Last week, we talked about David and Joab. If Joab was a true friend, he would have used discernment and said, David, what you're doing is wrong. Let's spare a whole bunch of people a lot of heartache. But he didn't do it. He didn't tell the truth. Tell the truth in love. So James and John 
came to Jesus one time and said, hey, when we get to the kingdom, can we sit on your right and left hand? One time their mother even did that. And Jesus says, do you realize what you're asking? Now, again, people pleasers in that situation might have said, oh, man, I'll, Wow, that would be great, guys. That would be great if, we, if you could do that. If you could, one of you would be here and one of you would be here. Like, I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. People pleasers in the moment, they say what they think is going to make the person feel good and approve of them. But Jesus was honest. And he said, do you realize what you're asking? Can you suffer like I'm going to suffer? And they said, yes. And he said, well, guys, here's the truth. You will suffer. You will suffer like that. But it's not up to me to grant people to sit on my right hand or my left hand. That's for my Father in heaven. I'm going to tell you the truth, even though it's uncomfortable. You're asking the wrong question, and you are going to suffer. Those are hard things to say when you're in the moment in a friendship, but Jesus was honest. Another time in Luke 22, Jesus said to Peter something very uncomfortable. He said, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Now, this is a, it's a kind of a mysterious phrase, but what Jesus was saying is that Satan has asked that your faith would fail. Our adversary, the devil, is coming against your faith, and he wants your faith to fail. But Peter, I've prayed for you. I'm going to tell you an uncomfortable truth, but I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And then Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. People pleasers, I don't know what they would have said in that situation, but Jesus looked Peter in the eyes and said, Peter, before morning, before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me three times. You will deny me. He told him the truth. Do I pass the booger test? I hope that helps you remember <laughs> this, this point. Question number four. Am I dependable? Am I the kind of friend that is dependable? Years ago, I was living in Indiana, Pennsylvania. I was in college, and uh, it was really, really cold in Indiana, single digits cold. And I was in a parking lot, went to my car, and I had a flat tire. So I needed to get the spare out of my trunk. It was under the floorboard of my trunk. So I opened my trunk, I lifted up the floorboard, and there must have been some sort of moisture leak in my Honda Civic because my spare tire was frozen in a solid block of ice. I had no tools with me. It was freezing, single digits, and I'm trying to chip this thing away with the tools that came, like the jack tools. You know, I'm trying to chip ice away and get this wing nut loosened. And a friend drove by and saw me. We were both going to the same place. We were both going to this gathering of friends that was hanging out, and he stopped, and he's like, what are you doing? And I told him, and I said, I'm really struggling here. And he's like, man, good luck with that. I'll see you at the party. And he left. I'm like, okay, I may need to move him out of the friend category. He is not dependable. I could really use a flashlight or a hammer or something. Could you help me out? Nothing. And, and I even asked him. He said, no, it's too cold. I asked him to help. He said, it's too cold. He was not dependable. When the disciples were in a storm in the boat and Jesus was in the back sleeping, the first place they went was to Jesus. Jesus, wake up. Don't you care that we drown? Help us. They went to Jesus because Jesus was dependable. They knew they could depend on him. In the garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus was arrested and beaten, and take up, before he took upon himself the sin of the world, he asked three of his disciples to come. They were sleeping. He asked them to stay awake with him, but they were sleeping. And he went and he said, Father, if there's any way I can get out of this, if there's any way this cup of suffering can pass away from me. Please hook me up. But, not my will, but your will be done. Because I'm dependable. And I'm going to do what I came to do. Jesus is dependable. Are we dependable? And finally, the fifth question. Do I exhort? I love the word exhort. It's a little, more, it's a little stronger than encourage. I wrote down, I'm trying to encapsulate what this word means to me. Courageously encouraging another to live their best life. Exhorting includes affirmation, affirming people toward God's goals and dreams for their lives. It includes pushing. It includes uncomfortable pushing sometimes to help people reach their best. 
do I exhort Jesus when he was with his disciples. The whole Gospels is like a classroom. The Gospels are a classroom of Jesus exhorting his disciples, of training them, of pushing them to grow stronger and stronger and more effective in ministry. When the the 5,000 plus were hungry and the disciples came to Jesus, Jesus said, you feed them. I'm going to push you a little bit. You, You feed them. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is exhortation after exhortation. Jesus pushing his disciples. If somebody hits you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. If they ask for your shirt, give them your coat as well. If they ask you to go one mile, go two miles with them. You've heard that it was said this. I tell you, I'm going to make it even more challenging because I want to push you. I want to exhort you. I want to bring the best out of you. In Matthew 28... Go therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. I want to push you into an incredible life of purpose and serving me. Do I exhort? Okay. We evaluated our friends. Remember, friends, biblically, we put people in that category based on fruit, not feelings. Do they demonstrate those things? So as you think about your friends... And last week, I asked you to think about your relationships and if they bring glory to God and help you accomplish God's purpose for your life. Again, we're not using people. We're being intentional. We love and value all people equally. All people are made in God's image. But these close friendships, are we positioning the people that are closest to us? Do they deserve to be there? Are they trustworthy? Have they proven themselves? Do they have unconditional love? Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times, and a brother or sister was born for a time of adversity. True friends don't don't leave when you have a tire frozen in your trunk, but they don't leave when things aren't going so well, when things get a little uncomfortable. Do you have people in your life that show you unconditional love, that create space for you when you're at your best and your worst? Do they have integrity? Have they proven themselves to have integrity, to be honest? Proverbs 10, 9. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. Are they honest? Do they pass the booger test? Proverbs 26. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Hard truth. Hard truth from a friend can be trusted. It's not to manipulate you. It's not to get something for them. It's to push you to be your best. But an enemy multiplies kisses. Anyone can flatter, but a true friend tells the truth at all times. Are they dependable? Have they proven themselves dependable? Proverbs 18, 24. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And do they exhort you? Are they willing to push you, to challenge you, to be at your best? We need more than just people to hang out with. I love hanging out with people. It's one of my favorite things to do. I'm I'm a very relational, uh, extroverted person, and being with people brings me energy. And I love to hang out. But I need more than just people to hang out with. I need people who will push me, exhort me, to be at my best, to tell me the truth even when it hurts. As iron sharpens iron, Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So who are your friends? I hope that you'll spend some time this week and and think about and reflect and not judge, but discern. It's a prayerful process. And I want you to know that as I was preparing this message, and and I'm committing after this message, that I will pray for you, all of you, here at home, those tuning in later, that God would help you in this. Because some of you need a friend. Some of you feel like you've been trying to go without that person, without that inner circle, that person that, that will walk alongside you and just be with you when you need it. And push you when you need it and tell you the truth when you need it and a person that you can do that for. And I'd like to pray now. And before I pray, I also have to say, you know, I'm sorry, this just came to me. I shared a lot of examples of Jesus today. All of these questions, 
All of these questions are modeled by Jesus. And just like Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you servants. I now call you friends. I believe that Jesus, who is trustworthy every single time, wants to invite us closer and closer and closer every day into a friendship with him. Again, without that, our earthly relationships will falter and fail. Let's pray. God, we thank you for being the friend of sinners. Thank you for being a faithful God, faithful and true, always good. Thank you that you always love us. Thank you that you are trustworthy, that you tell us the truth to set us free, that we can depend on you. Thank you for pushing us. God, I pray that you would help each of us to be friends that glorify you, that we would model all of these truths from your word. And I pray that you would provide friends for us. I pray for those who feel like they don't have that person, that you would lead them to that person and that person to them. That even this week, through their circumstances, that they would just bump into somebody, that they would bump into a blessing that they would be a blessing that someone else could bump into. Guide them. Direct them. I pray for those who are experiencing anxiety and stress and frustration because of some friendships that have been, or there's been broken trust. I pray that you would bring healing and forgiveness and reconciliation and that you would help them discern discern how those relationships should look into the future. And God, I pray for everyone who needs a closer friendship with you, that you would invite them through your Holy Spirit, through your word, through their circumstances to draw deeper and deeper into that relationship. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.